Boa tarde, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you again at the Library of the University of Ghent today. Um, the Belgian Portuguese Chamber of Commerce and its uh, partner, Matriz Portuguesa, that co organized here in the Ghent uh, Library, uh, the University of Ghent Library, the exhibition gallery of the Portuguese Queens. We have the pleasure to host another lecture on a very interesting topic about the Portuguese trading post in uh, Bruges and Anvers, or Antwerp. And um, as you may know, uh, this exhibition has been opened here in the, on the 8th of October, and it's still uh, going, so until the 29th of October. So please do come to the library of the University of Ghent. It's an, an interesting um, digital exhibition about the Portuguese queens and also the dynastic, dynastic links between Portugal and Flanders. As, uh, regards the lecture. I have the pleasure to welcome today uh, Professor uh, Georges Martin. He was uh, born uh, in 1966 in Abelgen, studied law and the medieval studies in Kortrecht and uh, Leuven. In 1996, he defended his PhD thesis on early modern private law legislation in Southern Netherlands. From 1992 to 2008, he was a lawyer uh, and a barrister. And since 1999, he teaches legal history, legal methodology, and general introduction to law in Kent. He is also a substitute magistrate, uh, Justice of Peace. His main uh, fields of research are the history of the legal professions, legal iconography, and early modern private and public law. And I can also reassure you that he speaks beautifully Portuguese, which is really a pleasure for me as a Portuguese citizen to hear uh, a Flemish um, citizen to speak uh, the Luis Camões language uh, so well. Uh, today, the topic, as I said, is the Portuguese trading post in Bruges and Antwerp. Before I give the floor to the professor, I would like to thank uh, our uh, supporters. Um, this exhibition would not be possible without uh, the support of the Library of the University of Ghent that is hosting the, the event, uh, the Portuguese Ministry of Culture, the Camões Institute, the Municipality of Viena do Castelo, and uh, of course, most importantly, our partner, Matriz Portuguesa, and his president, João Miguel, in Lisbon. So please, uh, Professor Jorge Martin, I give you the floor and thank you for your accepting the invitation, please. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And before starting my actual presentation, I would like to me in the language Portuguese, uh, só algumas frases para dizer que sinto muito orgulho uh, em estar aqui e agradeço-lhes, agradeço à, à Câmara de Comércio uh, Belgo-Portuguesa uh, o convite uh, e também ao meu amigo e o bolso honorário uh, que estão presentes aqui uh, e, e é uma grande honra para mim e um grande prazer para poder falar sobre uma pequena parte da minha pesquisa que fui fazer a Lisboa, uh, Lisboa que é a minha cidade preferida, que é a mais bela cidade uh, do mundo, uh, então uh, é sempre um prazer ir lá, uh, de vez em quando também dar palestras lá e hoje é um prazer uh, fazer esta palestra aqui. Preparei os slides em francês, uh, but I'm going to talk in English, uh, because uh, most of our listeners probably uh, will uh, more understand English than they will understand uh, Portuguese or, or French. Uh, as you introduced me, I am a jurist and a historian, uh, but in the first place a jurist, and this means that I look to old documents through the glasses of a jurist. And so what I will explain to you this afternoon um, has a very, very juridical aspect, a very legal aspect. Uh, so. Uh, Normally, what jurists do is very boring. I will try uh, not to bore you too much eh, and come to the most important points on the legal organization of actually your predecessors. Eh? Because if there is today a chamber of commerce uh, between Portugal uh, and, and Belgium, it's actually some kind of chamber of commerce that uh, the Feitoria, the Consulus, uh, and the Nação Portuguesa uh, during the uh, Ancien Regime uh, were. Uh, I will uh, divide my presentation in three parts, an introduction 
starting in Bruges and then moving to Antwerp because we have most sources, legal sources preserved on the Antwerp period of the Nassau Portuguese. Uh, then I will explain how this nation, uh, Nassau, is organized, what the competences are of the people in that uh, Portuguese nation in Antwerp. And I will conclude by saying that it was a minority indeed, a small group, but a very well protected minority and a minority which managed to um, claim its rights throughout centuries, uh, much more than the Spanish, for instance, uh, ever did uh, in our regions. The first uh, testimonies of presence of uh, Portuguese in, in Flanders and let's say in, in the Netherlands uh, is already in, in the Middle Ages. And we know already that in the 12th century, people coming from Portugal with their, uh, with their trade uh, came to Flanders and fixed their domicile, fixed their, their homestead uh, in, in Bruges. So there was already a small, a small group of um, merchants, Portuguese merchants in uh, Bruges. And one of the things that is most important on a legal level for that uh, medieval period is that the Portuguese are most famous at that time for their maritime insurance. Uh, their boats coming from so far away, coming to Bruges, uh, have uh, a, a type of insurance which has become general uh, all over Europe and, and all over the world even. The Portuguese were really forerunners uh, in organizing uh, those uh, insurances. Um, and from the very beginning, they talked with the local competences, with the local authorities, uh, with the municipality of Bruges, but they also talked with the Count of Flanders in order to get some legal protection for what they did. Um, I mentioned here on the slide some of the most important works uh, on that Bruges original community. We can talk uh, about a nation uh, in, not in, in the present day uh, meaning of the word, eh? but a nation, une nation, eh? a nation, eh? and it's actually the word also used during the Ancien Regime. The uh, uma nation, uh, a nation is actually a group of people coming from the same region. Like for instance, we have nations in the medieval universities. In, in the University of Bologna, there is a Flemish nation. And not only people from Flanders, but also people coming from Brabant eh, or, or from the region here. But when they're in, uh, in Bologna, mm -hmm. uh, they meet each other in their own language and they form a group, a group to, to, to strive for, for the protection of their own uh, rights, for instance, eh? but also a group just to come together and, and to, to have drinks at, at that. And that's the, the nation in university context. And the commercial nations also exist all over Europe, wherever uh, a port is or, or an important market. You see that people talking the same language and having the same background and the same history, they come together because together you're strong. And that's actually the reason to start with uh, that nation. Is it because of the merchants doing well commerce between Portugal and Flanders, or is it pure dynastic, a fact is that there is a very good interaction between the merchants and the royal families. And we see royal marriages uh, uh, already in the 13th century. Uh, uh, it's, she's called our uh, Countess Mathilde, uh, uh, who is married to the Count of Flanders, Philip Dalsas, but she's actually, she, she had a, a, a Portuguese name. Uh, she changed name. Uh, coming from this uh, side, but also uh, Ferrand de Portugal eh, uh, was married to uh, Jean de Constantinople, but most important, of course, and most well known, and I have a big uh, specialist uh, of that period here uh, in, in the room, is uh, the Isabelles, eh, uh, the first Isabel uh, de Portugal, who marries to uh, the Duke of Burgundy, but important to say that Duke of Burgundy at that moment is the Count of Flanders. Eh? And, and they have their joyous entry in, in Bruges in, in 1430. But then, of course, in the 16th century, there's again an Isabel de Portugal, uh, who, uh, daughter of the famous King Manuel, uh, and she marries to our famous emperor, to, the, to Charles V. 
So certainly those dynastic uh, bonds are very important because when Isabel comes to Flanders, uh, she brings several boats full of people eh? and, and they stay in, in the courts here. And so we, we have, uh, for instance, uh, very um, in, important um, studied people eh? uh, who, um, who come from Portugal and, and who, uh, who come here to, to teach us uh, as well. Uh, important at that moment is that the, the relations between the two regions, let's say, it's first it's Flanders as the county, but then of course it becomes Le Pays Bas, uh, Baixos, the Netherlands. Um, and uh, within those dynastic bonds um, and the mutual respect they give to each other and the rights they give to each other, we see reciprocity. When uh, the Count of Flanders says, Portuguese merchants, you'll be safe in Bruges and I will protect you. And also the, the municipal uh, government of uh, Bruges says, we give you some rights and eh, some exemptions of taxes, for instance, and that kind of thing, I will come to that. Exactly the same rights are given to the Flemish nation in Lisbon. So there also has been a Flemish nation in Lisbon, unfortunately, eh, because of the big earthquake of the 18th century, we have almost no resources, no uh, original documents, uh, but it is studied um, by some people, like for instance, uh, by my colleague here from Ghent University, uh, John Evra, who uh, studied La Nation Flamande uh, at Lisbon. Um, at the end of the 15th century, for reasons I cannot uh, delve into at this moment, it would take me too long, but for several reasons, again, both political reasons and economical reasons, the um, Portuguese group of merchants moves to Antwerp around 1500. It has much to do with rebellion against uh, Maximilian uh, of uh, Austria. Um, for instance, Maximilian says to all foreign nations, if you would choose to leave Flanders, because that is leaving Flanders, leaving Bruges is leaving Flanders, and if you would move to the duchy of Brabant, and if you would settle in uh, Antwerp, then in Antwerp you will have all the same privileges as you had in the county of Flanders. Uh, so that is a good reason for many nations to move towards um, Antwerp. And that at that moment, and here I'm speaking again as uh, a jurist, uh, legally this is important because Bruges is Flanders and Flanders has a Supreme Council of Justice and the Council of Flanders, which had its seat here very near in the, in the Count's castle here in Ghent. But you could also appeal from the end of the 15th century onwards to the Great Council of Malines, which was the highest court in the Netherlands. But at the moment you change to Brabant, Brabant is what it's called a sovereign country. It has a sovereign council of justice and you cannot appeal to the Great Council of Malines. And that is a little bit a pity for us now because van, Robert van Answaarden has studied uh, quite some, some decades ago already, but he made a beautiful book on all the legal questions that were treated by the Great Council of Malines with the Portuguese, eh? uh, les Portugais devant le Grand Conseil de Malines. Uh, but okay, that's all about, or almost everything is about uh, Flanders, of course, and the first period, the period in Bruges. From the moment they change to um, Brabant, um, they, they fall completely under the municipal jurisdiction and then under the Council of Brabant, no longer the Council of Malines. There is already a nation organized with own consuls, and I will explain what consuls are in, uh, in a minute, uh, in Bruges, and they all move to, um, to, to Antwerp. And in Antwerp, uh, there are several well-organized nations, eh, like the Spanish nation uh, and the German Hansa. Eh? Um, and all those have been very well studied, and especially for the Portuguese nation, I uh, make reference to the studies by uh, Horis and Paul, one is in Dutch, one is uh, in, uh, in, in German, and they have well studied that um, Antwerp, Portuguese nation together with other nations there in the big port of uh, Antwerp. And we know from those studies, for instance, that 
the uh, municipal government of Antwerp um, gave uh, a property, gave a building to the uh, Portuguese nation, and uh, they called it Casa de Portugal. Uh, and the Casa de Portugal was really the, the center of the Portuguese nation uh, in Antwerp. It stayed there uh, and in the hands of the Portuguese until the end of the Ancien Regime. And it is only when the French troops come in and really make an end to all uh, our, our, um, our justice uh, tribunals, for instance, uh, it's, it's all abolished by the French. And one of the things they also abolish at that time is uh, the Portuguese nation and, and the jurisdiction of uh, the consuls, uh, I will uh, come back to. But the Portuguese have also their own chapel uh, in uh, Antwerp, for instance. So they're well organized and they're in a certain region of town. One of the first slides uh, was with uh, an old painting of uh, the La Bourse d'Anvers, eh, of the old uh, exchange at uh, Antwerp. For instance, Joan Brandão, who was one of the feitores, eh, one of the factors uh, representing the king in, uh, in Antwerp. He had the privilege that he was the only man who could walk into the exchange uh, with his weapon. And all other people had to leave weapons outside. But João Brandão, as the Portuguese factor, was so important that he could uh, carry on his uh, weapons into uh, the exchange. Now, I already said something about a factor and about consuls and about the nation. So we should not mix up things. Actually, it all started early with a uh, legal decision by Don Diniche, already at the end of the 13th century, who said all the merchants who go to Bruges, you have a privilege, eh? and I organize, I give you the permission to organize Uma Bolsa. Eh? Uma Bolsa. And it was actually some kind of mutual insurance for if they would have any disaster going to, uh, to Bruges. So they all, all merchants put a little bit of money together in one bolsa, so to say, eh, in, in one purse. So for the, for the moment that they would have uh, any problem. This idea of the bolsa is a, abandoned as a word, eh, but what they do continues for centuries. And so they keep on having the, that mutual uh, insurance, but la, a bolsa disappears from the documents. Now there's a, a second uh, institution which appears in the 15th century and will last until the middle of the, 50, of the 16th century. The last factor leaving Antwerp leaves Antwerp in 1549. And um, Ufeitor, eh, Feitoria, uh, there has been a splendid exhibition on Feitorias uh, in Europalia uh, 1991. Eh? Um, the the, the, the Feitor is, is actually, he's not an ambassador, He's not a, a, a diplomat, but he's a very important representative of the king. Uh, you can compare him to some kind of diplomat, but at the same time, he's also a commercial man because he, um, he defends the monopolies of, of the king. Yeah? And that is, for instance, uh, the, the space trade, uh, uh, spice trade, sorry, the spice trade uh, and uh, the sugar trade, uh, for instance. Yeah? Um, so uh, that factor um, is always a, a Portuguese man, and it's someone coming specially from Portugal with the function to be the factor. Uh, and it's always a man from a rich family. And the man I, I mentioned, João Brandão, is one of the most uh, famous. He was really very wealthy. Um, he invited, for instance, Albrecht Dürer uh, when he came visiting uh, the, the Netherlands, he invited him at his home and um, he had a, a servant, um, a black servant, and the painting, the portrait of that black servant is one of the most famous paintings by, uh, by Dürer. Dürer uh, gave several uh, presents to uh, the factor and the factor gave several presents uh, to uh, Dürer. Um, the, the factor, and not only João Brandão, also uh, other factors uh, before him, uh, were also really people uh, loving high culture. Uh, and for instance, I, I think I should mention that Damian de Bois, uh, one of the major humanist writers, uh, was also at a certain moment the secretary of the factor in Antwerp. 
So it was really the house of the factor was not only a commercial heart for the uh, Portuguese nation, it was also the cultural heart for uh, those uh, Portuguese and their uh, friends. But the factor leaves in 1549 Antwerp, and then we have no Feitoria anymore. Although the documents preserved in Lisbon, in the archives, in the Torre do Tombo, they are still called Feitoria de Antwerpia, and they say it's from the 14th century until 1795, but actually it's not completely correct. All those documents are not about the Feitoria, but are, most of them are about a nação, the nation. So and now I come to the nation and I will only talk uh, for the rest of my time on that uh, nation. That nation is an organized nation. They have, for instance, uh, chiefs. And every year they choose two consuls, not one. Now we have one consul is enough today. Yeah? Uh, they can do it all. Yes. But at that time there were two consuls. And also each year they uh, elected a secretary and they elected uh, also uh, a treasury, yes? the man who was uh, responsible for the money. About that money, uh, I will explain a little bit. Now, how did they do that? Eh? Uh, every year, at the beginning of the year, uh, at the Epiphany, on the 6th of uh, January, all the Portuguese were invited to come to the Casa de Portugal. And we know that at some times there were very few people, 15, 20 people, and because some of the reports of those general assemblies are preserved, and we can consult them in Torre do Tombo. Eh? Uh, but because at some times there were very few people, um, they insisted, not only the consuls, but also the municipal authority said, you have privileges, then you have to live up to those privileges and you have to be aware that this is important. So if you're Portuguese, you have to come to the General Assembly. And people were really, uh, they were sent a messenger to the people at home, knocking at the door and saying, you have to come. Today, it's, uh, it's the national, it's the, the, the annual uh, assembly. So some of those invitations, eh, they were actually almost legal citations, and you have to go to, to the General Assembly. Those are preserved in the Torre Tombo. At that moment, when, when they come together uh, in the beginning of January, uh, they also have a drink, as we know, eh, because we see on the expenses that they bought some drinks for that occasion, but they paid also every year some uh, Jesuit uh, priests because there must have been some kind of holy mass to start with. And then the, those Jesuits uh, were present all the, uh, the assembly. Eh? They, they did the prayers for, during uh, the assembly and at the end of the assembly. And then they had the elections. They elected two consuls. And it happened in the 15th and beginning of 16th century that sometimes the Feitor was elected as a consul. So that happened. So sometimes one man had two hats, let's say. He was the, the diplomat for the king, and he was at the same time one of the two bosses of uh, the nation. Also, uh, in the beginning, for terms of three years, later on, yearly, they uh, elected six representatives. And actually, they, those people did not have to do that much. They, they were elected, and they um, were invited to come together if there was a problem, if there was a major problem because smaller problems had to be solved by the two consuls. I will explain what their uh, function was more concretely. This starts already in the 15th century and it lasts until the end of the 18th century, but uh, after the revolt, after the fact that uh, first Antwerp is a Calvinist city and then the Spanish troops take again uh, Antwerp, many of the Protestants, many of the uh, rebellions, and also many of the Portuguese leave Antwerp. So from the end of the 16th century onwards, there are not so many Portuguese anymore. And some are rich from rich people and still do a lot of commerce with Portugal. And they are literally called in the documents, os mais interessados. Yeah? They have really interest in coming together in talking about their common interests. While there are many other people, like for instance, grand grand grandsons of original Portuguese merchants, but who now just, they're born in, in Antwerp, they speak Dutch and they 
maybe also a little bit of Portuguese, but they're actually, they could be considered as, as real Antwerp people. And, and they do all kinds of jobs. They help in, in, the, in the commerce part uh, with the Portuguese, but often they do also other things. But officially, they're from a Portuguese family. They have still Portuguese names normally. And so they are expected to come, but if they do not come to the national, uh, to the annual assembly, then uh, the Maish Interessados say, okay, no problem, because you're not high level and you're only menus or in nada interessados. Uh, and so they didn't have uh, to come. From 1570 onwards, it is the municipal government. And so it, it, it are um, the, the mayor um, of uh, the mayor and Mayor uh, the the Antwerp, who, who make rules on how this had to happen. So you see really a, a, a mixture between what is originally Portuguese and what becomes a locally, legally organized um, framework, let's say. Um, what are the competences? According to those long lists of, um, of rules on, on that nation. First of all, uh, they are in charge of the Casa de Portugal. Casa de Portugal, uh, sometimes there's a storm and uh, the roof has to be fixed. So someone has to do it. The consuls eh, uh, have um, to, um, to make sure that, that the Casa de Portugal uh, is okay. But they also rent warehouses for Portuguese goods. So also for hiring those warehouses, eh, um, they're responsible. They are the ones who have to ask the Portuguese taxes. And this is the most important part of the income. All Portuguese goods coming in have to pay one tax to the nation. So it's the consul who's responsible uh, that this is paid and it's the treasury uh, who uh, makes, um, let's say the, the, the reckoning of, uh, of that all. Um, and then they use those taxes, uh, for instance, um, for uh, also their um, religious services and eh, for their own parties, but sometimes also for, for very uh, big expenses, like they, um, they um, commend art works for, for their chapel, for instance, and that costs a lot. And this is paid by the, the taxes uh, on the Portuguese goods. Most important role they have as a consul is that they really have to protect the rights of the Portuguese nation. And you will see and you will hear that those rights are really something to be jealous of. And many other nations have many less uh, of that um, privileges. So they really went to court, for instance, to, to say, don't forget that other nations have to pay that tax, but we don't have to pay that tax. Or uh, if everybody has to uh, help in the protection of the city. And so it's, it's a citizen duty that you're in the Garde Civile, yeah? but the Portuguese say, we don't have to do that because we have an exemption. And so they really protect that. They go to court to protect that. Everything that they do is um, signed by the consuls. They are, they are the authority to, um, to engage the, the nation and all the goods that enter receive uh, a stamp from uh, the consuls. And it's a stamp with the letters NP, uh, referring to Nazio Portugalensis. So all the goods coming in. And what are all the goods? These are, of course, the Portuguese goods. And the classic Portuguese goods, it's always about wine, about raisins, about sugar. Uh, from a certain point onwards, uh, it's also salt from Stubal. Uh, and it's cork, of course, from the Alentejo, uh, and then later on, it's sugar from the Azores and, and, and from Brazil, and spices, of course, from uh, Africa and Far East. Uh, and all those uh, goods are uh, marked with that uh, NP, but not only the Portuguese goods, all other foreign goods transported in Portuguese boats are also considered Portuguese goods. So they only have to pay one tax if they come in in Antwerp. It's the tax for the Portuguese nation. And there's also even if uh, a Portuguese buys goods 
and says to a Portuguese trader, can you bring it by boat to Antwerp? It's enough that a Portuguese buyer that also the Portuguese uh, can claim the this is from the Nazio and this is uh, with our tax and not with the other taxes. Taxes is for all nations very important and all the nations, also the, the, the Spanish and, uh, and the Italian nations, uh, they, they try uh, to be exempted as much as possible from those taxes. For instance, there's tax on wine and on beer and on soap and really on almost everything. Um, and the Portuguese, they do not mention to really not pay any tax, but for instance, for wine and beer, they can have each year a certain amount of tons of wine and beer without paying taxes on it. And that's then the wine and the beer. They distribute among each other and they use in their own Casa de Portugal when uh, they have a fight. Most important uh, duty or competence uh, of the consuls is that they are the responsibles for that maritime insurance. So if a boat comes in and some of its goods are damaged or the boat itself is damaged, the, the two consuls go in the boat and they look at, uh, at the goods and they can tax the damage and they can say, eh? and actually the, the original Portuguese word, eh? avariar, eh? avarie, eh? has become a Flemish word, avare. Eh? We, we took that Portuguese word Avre is a very concrete type of damage to goods. It's the damage to goods that are transported. And it comes from Portuguese and it comes from, from uh, this uh, period. Um, but, okay, Portuguese come with their family. There are also children, people die, and then the children um, need protection. And so the tutor for uh, the, the whole system of the tutelage is organized by the consuls. So the, the consuls will or be tutored themselves or look for a Portuguese tutor for the uh, minors uh, who need uh, a parent. They're also responsible uh, and they pay a lot eh, for artworks. I said one of the major um, expenses they made was really a an, an triumphal arch and an, an enormous construction for the joyous entry uh, of the cardinal infant in. Uh, Antwerp, uh, and they um, asked, for instance, uh, Van Loon, who was a famous painter at that moment, to make the paintings for that uh, big uh, arch. And we still have preserved uh, um, um, some projects of, of that arch. It, it was really, uh, everybody talked about it. Uh, but the, the Portuguese entry arch was the most beautiful uh, of all. So it must have cost a lot. Then uh, they, they were also the responsibles, the consuls, to talk with the city and or to write to the city and, and receive uh, responses. Um, if needed, they go to a local lawyer to ask advice. Uh, and also they use a local notary. And it's all, almost the same notary and the same family of notaries. Uh, so we can learn a lot. And these are documents I have not studied yet. Some others already have, but I'm looking forward to be able to do it. Uh, there's a lot of documentation on the family life of the Portuguese in Antwerp, thanks to the fact that they always use the same notary for their wills, for instance, eh, and, and for their contracts. Um, if there was any dispute uh, with the city or with other nations or with other uh, particular uh, merchants, also the consuls took responsibility to, um, to take care of that. As far as the persons is uh, concerned, eh, they can act as judges. They, they are the judges deciding on, for instance, uh, quarrels within a family eh, or most, uh, most frequent disputes between two neighbors. Eh? And if the two neighbors are Portuguese, then they do not go to the city court. They come to the consuls to have a solution. So all the Portuguese in Antwerp, and if they want to, also all the Portuguese elsewhere in the Low Countries can go to the consuls uh, with their uh, problems. What kind of problems? Of course, in the first place, I referred already to it, the maritime competences. Eh? 
uh, all Portuguese uh, products, all products uh, transported by the Portuguese or in Portuguese uh, boats. Insurance is there the most important competence. But they also have a civil competence. So they also decide on the partition of successions, for instance. When there's a quarrel within the family, who, who should inherit the house and who should inherit uh, something else? Well, they go to the consuls. When they uh, have a, a problem with a, a contract between two Portuguese, they go to the consuls. And the consuls decide those things in, in a very short proceeding. There is no, for instance, I have until now not, find, not found any reference to the assistance of a lawyer in the consular court. And so the consuls, they, they sit in their Casa de Portugal, the two parties come to discuss, and maybe we, we should even, I'm not very sure, but I think we can say it's some kind of uh, mediation even, and trying to solve the problem. And if it's not possible with mediation, they decide. But then, if it's decided, one of the parties can appeal, and then they can appeal to the normal city courts. And I will come back to that. They even have a very small competence on what we could call criminal law, although it's not really criminal. For instance, murder not. If one Portuguese would shoot, shoot another Portuguese, it, that won't be handled by, by the consul. Uh, but there are uh, small fines, for instance. Eh? There are lots of rules. And one of the rules is you have to come to the annual general assembly. Eh? Um, or um, when you have goods coming in, you have to pass by the consul and stock them first in our uh, warehouse eh? before you can transport it to your own warehouse. That's all um, in, in rules. And if you break the rules, uh, then you have to pay fine. And so the consuls decide on uh, those fines, but also they, they, they can um, put uh, fines on people who have insulted each other uh, or who have had quarrels and they fought, for instance, then also uh, they can be uh, sanctioned. You should not really say that this is criminal law, but it's, uh, it's at least it's sanctioning people for what they have done wrong. And this completely independent. So the consuls don't have to ask for advice at anyone else. They have their own competence to, to decide all those problems within their community. But if one of the parties does not agree, they can appeal. And then they go to the court um, of, of the city of Antwerp. City of Antwerp, um, which is normally the competent court for all problems for Antwerp people, for everyone living there. And again, if that decision is not to your satisfaction, you can again appeal to the Conseil Souverain de Brabant and to the highest council, uh, which is then in, uh, in Brussels. The consuls do it very briefly without proctors or uh, advocates, uh, as I said. Uh, but they can use and they, they can make use of other functionaries of the town. For instance, le huissier de justice, eh? uh, the court usher. Uh, there is no proper Portuguese court usher. So who has to do that? They can ask to uh, the, the municipal uh, court ushers to, to do that and eh? to, to cite people, uh, uh, to, to invite them to court, for instance. Uh, when they have to send, uh, send out a, a message, they can use the messengers from, uh, the, the, from the city uh, as well. And they use also notaries uh, to make appointments uh, of what they have uh, decided. So they have quite some privileges. They have and others not. For instance, and, and, and that is very important, I come back to that in a moment, the, the, Portuguese are the only nation having their own chapter in the codified custom of uh, Antwerp. All customs had to be codified at a certain moment. Antwerp has four uh, codified customs in four different uh, periods. And uh, in the third uh, codification, there's a chapter on the Portuguese nation and only on the Portuguese nation, not on the Spanish, not on the others, uh, only the Portuguese. Um, 
small group in the 15th century, around 20 to 30 uh, families, um, let's say, um, and they get their privileges from the city of Bruges and from the Duke of Burgundy. There you see some of the dates of those privileges. You can almost say that every new Count of Flanders confirms, and not only confirms, but also extends the number of privileges. 1386, 1411, 1421, etc. But in the 16th century, uh, when the group of Portuguese really grows in the first part of the 15th century in, um, in Antwerp, uh, it's, it's about 100 families. So if you count a family, uh, it's always uh, man and wife with several children. So let's say it's 300 to 400 people probably. Um, and not only families, because people who uh, often are in, uh, in Antwerp alone um, are people having come with boats from Portugal. When the boat came, they, they were several weeks on the way, but when the boat arrived, then it stayed sometimes the whole winter before going back to Portugal. And meanwhile, the, the, the working people of the boat, uh, they, had, they had to live somewhere, they had to find a place to sleep. And so then they could go to the Casa de Portugal as well uh, to stay there. And they were also counted as Portuguese belonging to the Portuguese nation, right? although they do not live really in Antwerp, but are only temporarily uh, in Antwerp. If you see here how many privileges they had in the 16th century, uh, the city of Antwerp in 1511 says, we give you all the privileges you had in Bruges. Everything you had there, we give it to you. And then they extended the privileges. Well, you see there the dates, are, I won't cite them all, but it's almost every 10 years that it's confirmed that they have privileges. Also the Duke of Brabant did so. And then you get the revolt in the Netherlands. So there's a lot of fighting and at a certain moment, um, Antwerp becomes part of the Northern Netherlands, let's say, where in the Northern Netherlands, there is no longer a king, but les états généraux, uh, the, the states general are, are the sovereign power. Well, the states general as well in 1577 and 1581 confirm again the Portuguese um, privileges. So this means that they do not only do it very well with the local uh, authorities and with the Brussels authorities, but with every new authority. So they must have been important to, to be able uh, to do this. Uh, at a certain moment, it's even, uh, it's the states of Holland and Zealand who give them uh, privileges. So this, this is really something all the time reiterated. Um, but then again, although they have, let's say every 10 years, a new confirmation of their privileges, it happens that there's a new problem. Uh, at a certain moment, the tax uh, or the city decides to put a new tax on soap. And everyone, everybody has to pay the tax on soap. And the Portuguese say, we don't have to pay the tax on soap. We don't pay any tax, nor on spice, uh, nor, nor on beer, nor on wine. So why should we pay on, uh, on soap? No, no, no. And they go to court for that. And it's a, a court proceeding that uh, lasts quite some time, but they win. They win indeed. So they really fight for their privileges. Uh, like, for instance, in 1580, eh, they have uh, the exemption that they don't have to participate in the Gap City and they don't have to walk around the city at night to protect uh, the city. In 1623, uh, 23, it's the, that uh, tax on, uh, on soap. And the most important um, proceeding, they, they managed to, uh, to win eh, and they have to appeal. Eh, uh, it's not really appeal, it's called revision, but that's... Uh, it, they have to go to the highest court in the Netherlands in revision to ask for a confirmation of what is called the clause of the most privileged nation. And they win the cause. And this means that whenever the city or the duke decides to give a privilege to one nation, for instance, to the Germans, then they have also to give it to the Portuguese. Uh, so uh, la clause de la nation plus favori. Um, and that's something they, they should really be very proud of because that no, no one else had that at, 
they could uh, take advantage from any other uh, privilege. This is all um, codified then, uh, as I said, uh, um, the, the, the customary law of the low countries had to be codified. That's already something uh, Charles V asked for. Um, and in several uh, phases, uh, most customary law is codified. In Antwerp, they have four codifications. And one of the most extensive one is the impre Impressi, and they were um, um, printed, and the, the printed uh, codification of 1582, where the Portuguese uh, have one chapter for their own, confirming that they have their own jurisdictions with the consuls, that they can rely on the functionaries of the city uh, for the execution of their decisions, uh, and that uh, if there's a problem, that the parties can appeal to the city court. In the 17th century, um, everything is once again, let's say, codified, and everything they had from ancient privileges is ranked in a beautifully organized new ordinance, uh, a new new piece of law, let's say, and 75 articles naming all the specific um, privileges uh, and rights the Portuguese have. And again, they go to court, both in Antwerp and uh, to Brussels, uh, again, for instance, for the, um, the Garde Communal, uh, uh, but also individual Portuguese uh, go uh, to court um, to say, um, of course, they, they are taxed and then they do not agree uh, with the taxes. And so it becomes uh, some kind of custom uh, at the beginning of uh, a proceeding uh, to ask, if you're Portuguese, are you Portuguese? Yeah? And you have to prove it that you're Portuguese because from the moment you are Portuguese, you have much more rights than uh, other people. Um, and so it becomes important to prove that you're Portuguese. Yeah? Uh, and uh, one of the, the, the most lovely uh, examples uh, is the fact that um, a, a man who was not born Portuguese had no Portuguese uh, family, uh, but he was Uporteiro. Uh, he was the, 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 the doorman uh, of, of the Casa de Portugal. And he was really a, a, a local man, uh, not speaking Portuguese, no, no Portuguese family. But he said, I'm working in the Casa de Portugal, so I'm Portuguese, so I should have all the rights of uh, the Portuguese. So uh, to conclude, um, I, I wanted to show you uh, how by, by legal documents, it is well proved eh, that the Portuguese, first in Bruges, then in Antwerp, were a very small minority. And they even became smaller over the years. Eh? It's, it's, it's really a small group. Eh? Um, but that they really did their best to preserve their rights, probably thanks to the dynastic links, yeah? probably also thanks to the fact that their secretary uh, put everything to writing. And in the Torre do Tombo, we have today nine registers, the oldest one going back to the 15th century, where you have all those uh, privileges. Um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful collection, and it proves that for centuries, they really preserved very well their documents, that they were really very careful uh, about those documents. They were important uh, for them. And the people who claim that they are Portuguese in the 18th century, for instance, they do everything in Portuguese, eh? in Dutch, in Dutch. Because the consuls, eh? they, they decided uh, in Portuguese because the, port the parties were Portuguese in the 15th and the 16th century. But from the 17th century onwards, most of those things are already in Dutch. And in the 18th century, all documents are in Dutch. They, they, uh, they hardly speak Portuguese among each other. So these are really families. Meanwhile, also with Dutch names, like uh, one of the famous consuls is uh, uh, Van Rilla. Van Rilla is a, is a, is a Dutch name. Eh? Uh, but he was from fourth or fifth or sixth generation Portuguese uh, descendants. And so people tried to prove that they were Portuguese to be able to enjoy uh, the privileges. Eh? Uh, they claimed those privileges uh, at the city level, they claimed it at the central uh, level, and they claimed it uh, against their uh, fellow uh, citizens. They really did everything to preserve their rights, eh? and thanks to the fact that they really put them in registers, we can now consult them in the Torre du Tombo um, in, uh, in Lisbon, and each time when they go to court, they say, eh, 
we have ancient privileges de toute ancienneté as long as mankind's memory we have those privileges although sometimes we know they were attributed for instance in 1623 and, and not earlier but they say de toute ancienneté so they really try to say we have customary law and, and there is nothing to change about that this is our our rights and, and we claim our rights and from the, the the Antwerp period onwards the old and original idea that uh, the Flemish people will protect the Portuguese if the Portuguese protect the Flemish, that reciprocity is completely forgotten. Uh, and it's, it's really one direction uh, protection of the Portuguese in, uh, in Antwerp. So this was what I wanted to introduce to you on this uh, Antwerp nation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Jorge Martin. Foi um prazer enorme uh, ouvir esta sua palestra. Um, obrigado por ter aceito o nosso convite. Thank you all uh, for being here today, both in, in this uh, beautiful room of the Library of the University of Ghent. It's interesting to see uh, we at the Belgian Portuguese Chamber of Commerce that we are the descendants uh, of these brave uh, Portuguese men and women that since the, at least the 12th century have been. Uh, working and trading here in, in Flanders and, and the, what we call today Belgium. So our uh, Chamber of Commerce dates back from 1938, but before us uh, for centuries, Portuguese uh, have been around trading. We don't have the, the privileges anymore, unfortunately, maybe we can claim these privileges too, uh, as we are uh, indeed Portuguese, but uh, it's uh, another evidence uh, as where we are so close, uh, Flemish and Portuguese people, have been hand in hand for 800 or more years, and, um, and we will continue doing so, at least uh, if it depends on the Belgian Portuguese Chamber of Commerce, you can count on us to do that. So thank you all for being here today. I remind that you have the chance still to come to, uh, to Ghent, to the University of Ghent, the library, to, to see this uh, beautiful exhibition of the Portuguese Queens, and we will um, be back uh, on 29th of October with um, the closing of this exhibition and uh, with uh, still some uh, guided tours to the, to the exhibition, please do contact uh, the Belgian Portuguese Chamber of Commerce if you would like to be invited. Thank you all for being here and have a good day. Have a good weekend too. Bye.